Mike Stewart, how are you? I'm doing all right, man. How about yourself? Uh, this is so fun. Thanks. It's something to look forward to in a, a very interesting time. So thanks for bringing some positivity and uh, uplifting energy into a day. Yeah. Oh, solid. Stoked to see you. Hey, um, I was thinking about when I asked you to do this, what immediately came to mind was a session that I got to have with you, Kelly Slater, and Mike Peach out at Cloudbreak. <laughs> I remember vividly. And what blew my mind, we had two sessions. We had a morning and then a really insane afternoon. But in the morning, I was paddling back out after a wave. And you pulled into what was a perfect ledge barrel. And as you came up over the foam ball, you took your bodyboard and kind of pushed it back, you think, under your thighs. And you really took your chest and kind of body surfed over the foam ball and then pushed your board back up and came out of the tube. And I don't I recall thought, that, but it sounds interesting. <laughs> well, I've always revered you and, and thought that you're the most barreled human on earth. But when I watched that, I just, I had no words. I was speechless. It was this. Well, actually, I think you got the 10 point ride in that heat. I think you won that heat. I think we all won that heat. That was a super sick, that was super fun. Oh, uh, it was amazing. For me to be with you and Kelly and Peach too, just my heroes, it was so rad at that wave. I learned a lot that session, to be honest, watching you guys ride barrels. Like I was in front of the barrel and you guys were like way deep in tubes. And it was inspiring to watch really you and Kelly trade off and see the similarities, but differences between surfboard and bodyboard riding. Yeah, don't kid yourself, people. He was getting deep. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was sick. No, cool. Oh, yeah, uh, that you uh, see the, uh, the uh, differences and nuances like that. Yeah, it's cool. So, Mike, bring me back to childhood. I believe it's the Big Island and how you found a bodyboard and where this whole thing started. Yeah, so, you know, growing up in Hawaii, you – you know go out go to the beach just like the thing to do right mom takes uh mom takes and dad takes kids to the beach and uh sometimes my dad would be working and my mom would take me and uh uh yeah i just remember just you know from early days just like catching whatever i could and um also using my imagination a lot like i was i because sometimes i would imagine that the waves were much bigger than they were and even though it would be like puny or just like surging up the beach, I'd be just be like, wow, what if I was like the size of an ant? And um, I used to always, when I was younger, I used to always like, uh, uh, like cruise in the garden and, and just walk around. And, and uh, I was really fascinated with stuff early on and really curious. And uh, so that kind of, that idea of um, uh, letting your imagination drift would happen a lot when I was doing that. But then when I would, be taken to the beach early days i would do that as well and um so i would imagine that the waves were much bigger than they were and i was the size of an ant and there's like all these heavy waves you know coming in they're like you know like less than a foot tall you know but uh I, yeah I think, uh, I think everybody rode their first wave on a bodyboard see i used to call them boogie boards and i use the term boogie and i think it's incorrect like i have people correct me like no it's bodyboard well, actually, you know, there's kind of been a movement recently about boogie because it's, it kind of more um, talks to the, or speaks of the fun involved. And cause it is, it's like, there's no rules, you know, call it you're up. And it came out of fashion, right? Like it was the eighties were like the boogie era. And so he, Tom was a little bit ahead of his time with the seventies and then with, you know, uh, late seventies and then the eighties was like boogie, you know, boogie this, and then it kind of went like, oh, that boogie is the worst name ever. And so that's when bodyboarding came up. And bodyboarding was kind of an appropriate name because, uh, you, you know, there's no rules to it. You stand on it, you kneel on it, you drop knee on it, you, whatever. Guys are doing freaking handstands, any kind. So there's no rules. Anything goes. And that's where bodyboarding came about. I think Tom Boyle uh, coined the name. And uh, they're, I think they're looking for it as well for, for, from uh, uh, Surfing Magazine, who was like uh, – you know, looking at making a publication and they're trying to figure out what it was. And Boogie is actually a brand name for that Tom Mori came up with. So, so yeah, I mean, it's whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the spirit of it. So Boogie was kind of like, so now like, you know, guys are, Hey, let's go bug, you know, or bug. Hey, when I, you know, we, we, we use that term more often now than we have say 10 years previously or 20 years previously. So bodyboard, boog, whatever, you know, 
I like it. I've always wondered because I'm like, I know the Tom Mori boogie board, which I told you I have mine right here. I had to show you this. I still have my Mach 7X Mori boogie. That's classic. Let me see the bottom of that thing. Check this out. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, right. Oh, so Scott, does that, I'm trying to think the X, if it has mesh in there or not. Oh, let me see the bottom where it's peeled up in the corner. It's all white. Yeah, yeah. You can glue that, by the way, with contact cement. Hey, I just busted this out too. Yeah, that's got mesh in it. I, that, I was do, the that was your first board? That's the first board I ever owned. My, I, I, I feel didn't come from a old right now. Because that's like, uh, that was after quite a bit of development was put into the boards. Um, that has like a mesh layer inside of it. So it's like a strengthening layer. And uh, so that's actually quite a bit more uh, strong than, than the original ones. The original ones were like wet leaves. They're, they're so soft. Like it was a totally different uh, deal. It was almost more uh, like body surfing where you're just holding onto the thing and just like, it was just super flexible. And I don't know how like Jack Lindholm dropped meat on that thing at pipe. It was pretty nuts, but he just he used to bend that thing and fold it. It was pretty nuts. Like back in the day, early days, you know, those first boards. When, when you were a kid, you know, imagining bigger waves and having the attraction to, to wave riding, when did pipeline present itself to you? Uh, you know, I, I saw it in the magazines, I think, probably first. Or actually, you know what? Come to think of it, when I was living on Oahu, because I was born on Oahu, and I remember going out there as a young young kid and seeing it on a pretty big day and just like going, wow, this, that's unbelievable. You know, it's like, but then I, then I took it, I, you know, it was probably some years had lapsed and uh, I didn't think about it again. And then I went back there, you know, and actually ended up going out on a really small day on the inside, you know, and now we're right, we surfing pipeline, you know, but it was just like, it was just full Grom and hood days. And then, um, and then I moved to the big island in like 76, I was about 14 or 15. And uh, then I flew over uh, once uh, and there's a guy that uh, this guy, Roger Pfeffer, one of my best friends at the time, Jeff, Jeff Pfeffer, and Roger Pfeffer was his dad. He used to always take me surfing. Um, you know, my, my, my mom and my dad split up early, early on. And so my dad kind of dug out. And uh, so I, he was kind of like my surrogate dad for a bit. And so he used to always take me down towards uh, uh, town and we surf town a lot. But um, on one day, it was like a really classic day. He knew it. And I missed a flight to go back to the mainland. And as a result, I was there like for an extra day or something. And uh, so I, he said, hey, it's, it's happening. And he told his uh, girlfriend at the time, hey, drive Mike out and take him, take him to pipe. And so I went, I, I went out there and uh, it was insane, man. I paddled out. And it was like probably like maybe 10 feet or so, 8 to 10. And it was just like unbelievable to to see it, you know, like, and I waited, I was probably on the, on the shoulder for like an hour or so, maybe longer, just watching it, you know, watching how intense it was, watching um, the crowd uh, interact, you know, how uh, they were so, uh, you know, aggressive, but, and it was just, the whole thing was just like mind blowing. It was just like 10 levels higher than anything I'd ever experienced, you know, and the wave itself was, it was so, uh, mesmerizing it it would it the way that it, it threw out just like defied gravity like you know most waves they come and they barrel but this wave it seemed like it just just <laughs> just kept going it was so hollow and so amazing and i just was like oh man i'm just so i got instantly intrigued with this like this is like the most incredible place on earth and i was like you know i gotta i gotta learn everything about this place, you know, I got a, like, man, this is like the, the frontier. And so that was kind of like when the, the first hook kind of got in and I was, um, yeah, just super intrigued with it. So that was my first real experience of being outside in the surf when it's happening 
And uh, eventually I slowly but surely moved into the lineup and caught some waves and, uh, and learned very quickly how intense the crowd was, like trying to get waves and like, like being, you know, going to the peak, because I'm used to going to the peak. So I would go to the peak, went to the peak and uh, trying to like start to paddle. And then four other guys down the line, like starting to paddle into the wave. And I'm like, oh my God, these guys are going to drop in. So I'd pull back. And as soon as I did that, it was like over. Like they just saw oh, this guy, is, he's going to pull back every time. Um, you know, had I maybe just gone and just said, ah, screw it, let these guys drop in. You know, I just didn't want to get, I didn't want to get hit by the board. I didn't want to get tangled up with the guys. I didn't want to get pounded. And, you know, so all these, all these things were running through my head. And uh, so I, I backed off. But as soon as I did that, it was like, it was impossible to get a wave. And then finally, like after waiting and waiting, waiting, I went way outside and over, like super deep. And um, a big West peak came in and this guy's like, ah, go, go, go. I'm like, oh, really? Oh, shoots, man. So I just went, it was a junk wave and they'd probably do it, get me out of the lineup. But uh, it was cool. You know, I got, got a couple waves. So that was, that was it. Were you one of the only bodyboarders in the lineup then? And was it kind of like surfers looking over their shoulder going like, what? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, there was um, a couple other guys that were out. Um, maybe, I think it was maybe Jack and Daniel Kaimi. And um, I think that was about it. But there, there wasn't a lot, a lot of bodyboarders, you know, that was, that was it. Um, and uh, if those guys weren't out, there wouldn't be anyone out, like any other bodyboarders out. So it was, uh, um, yeah, it was, it was interesting, you know, like, because, you know, in Hawaii, it's not as bad as some other places. And, and in the Big Island, like for, for me, it's like I basically would just surf around and, and everyone's cool. It's like kind of old school Hawaiian style where any craft is cool and respected and any craft is a go. And it's like there's not that much hang ups, you know. Um, however, you know, being brought up as a, a fair skinned kid in Hawaii was a little tough. And so I ran into uh, a lot of fights uh, out, you know. Um, and, and it, uh, so I, be, I kind of like uh, from an early age, I, I used to get punked a lot when I was younger. And so I, I got kind of punchy. So, um, uh, I became a bit pugnacious and <laughs> so, uh, I kind of have that, like that, that, uh, that in me, you know, just like, okay, let's go. This shoots, man, throw down and let's do it. And so, uh, cause it does, you know, Hawaii doesn't teach you to be timid or back down like that, like, or, you know be more respectful so um anyway it's just uh super important to have that kind of like that uh respect factor and um got a little bit off track there i'm not sure where that started but oh, kind of down a little tangent there i love it i want you to go off track as much as possible <laughs> that shouldn't be too hard yeah that's what we're doing here uh would you imp implement that attitude into the lineup because i i mean i watch bodyboards now and there's waves that you can take off on that really surfers don't have a chance with the verticality. And also there's certain deep ones at pipeline um, that I see, you know, bodyboarders have a, have a, have an opportunity there. Did you start to weed out waves like that? Or did you just get in the line of go, you know what, I'm just going to put my head down and start going. Um, no, it, it took me years actually to be able to get waves at pipe. So, I mean, back in the day, the pecking order was so definitive you know, it was before uh, social media and internet and all this kind of and video cameras for the most part, you know, like guys weren't just videoing that often. So um, what, what happened in the lineup kind of stayed in the lineup. Nobody would hear, you know, they'd hear stories and that's about it. But it was an era where it wasn't, you didn't think about the consequence of your actions so much. And so uh, it was pretty intense. So it's hard for me to get waves. So I should just go super deep and wait. And if the wave came to me and I was super deep, um, then I'd get a wave, you know, kind of like in the Wakita zone. Like, you know, he's kind of been successful with that strategy. Behind um, the boil. Yeah, yeah. Just way deep, you know, off of the peak because all the boys are in the peak. And so, you know, back then I was going to get anything, you know, especially on a bodyboard. It was like, there's no way. So it was um, probably about – four years, I guess, just going out there and surfing and keep surfing that end. And then, um, and then, you know, I kind of would slowly start going and then guys realized I wasn't blowing it as much. And so you start to gain a little bit more, you know, you start inching your way up the ladder. And so it took a long time, you know, back then. Um, nowadays I see guys, they paddle out. It's like, 
they they come out and it's like uh, almost like entitlement like oh this guy's you know oh i'm you know it's like oh there's a pecking you know there's no pecking order as much anymore and so it's it's kind of a different lineup now yeah. was there a wave or a season you know around that four year mark that like really you just said man this is this is it i'm gonna make this wave something for the rest of my life and i'm hooked yeah it's um probably that first session really was like the hook but i've had i had a couple other sessions one time you know i was up up in school in the mainland and then i came back and uh um there was a session i had at pipe and uh it was like insane quality like all-time pipe and I got some really good waves and I did some things that I kind of surprised myself. And that, that was a uh, uh, really like, wow, this is, this is incredible. There's so much possibility here. During so, that, was it during that time that, uh, you know, a wave that's now called Chopu, um, you decided to somehow find out about and then go and, and search out? Um, no, actually, um, I went over there, uh, you know, back in the day I would go with, uh, Boyle and, uh, we had, we had some, I had some amazing trips, uh, with Tom Boyle and he'd usually bring on some surfers as well. So I'd, I'd be traveling with like some crazy guys like Marvin Foster, Mickey Nielsen. Wow. And so, I mean, back in the day, it was like, it was pretty cool, you know, like we'd go like, so the first trip I, I went actually to um to indo with with um marvin and uh and then there was another trip uh around 85 i think it was 86 we went to Haiti with mickey ronnie burns was mickey ronnie burns glenn jeans wow. um buzzy kerbox was there for a little while you know just like uh it was, it was pretty cool so anyway and we're just surfing mainly in the varao area but then on a really big stormy day i walked i just wa started to walk i'm like okay Cause it was, it was pretty tough living, you know, um, you know, uh, no transportation, uh, out there, there's nothing really to do. And so I, one day I just like, okay, I'm just going to walk. So I just walked all the way to the end of the road and I saw that way for the first time, um, Te Opo, uh, and, uh, it was the first time I, I saw it and it was, and, and I looked at it from the, from the beach. And I just saw this wave coming in and folding on the shelf, but it looked like it was too shallow. And then just like gassing out, like just crazy spit, like, oh, how's this wave? And, um, and I didn't piece it together until some years later. But uh, another, you know, fast forward a few years, I think it was 90 or 89, 90, something like that. And then uh, we, we're, we won trips. We won. We won trips uh, from the PSAA tour to come first and second place. Won a trip down to Tahiti, and we're supposed to be going at the Bali High, uh, staying at the Bali High. But but uh, I think uh, Ian Karen said took the tick took the Bali High tickets, and then went there with his girlfriend. So we ended up like sleep on the porch of this like hostel. <laughs> so it's pretty nuts. But there was a there was a demonstration. Um, uh, Zodiac, uh, Zodiac team. And, um, and so what I did is I convinced one of them, cause we were like exploring on the other side of the island. I'm like, Hey, let's just, let's go explore the reefs on the other side. And so the guy's like, okay. So we had this little rent a car and then we, we, uh, flipped the, the rubber dinghy upside down. So it just fit the cup perfectly over the, over the, um, uh, it was like a little Yugo rent a car kind of thing. It was just a tiny little thing but it just fit perfectly. It just snug right on top. You know, you, it, it reduced the, the windshield. You had less view, visibility, but you could still see fine. And then you had to climb in through the windows because the, the doors was kind of secured locked. And then before that, we threw the, the engine in the back of the thing. And then, so uh, it was me and Chris Tenberg. And then these, uh, these, this guy from the, the Zodiac demonstration team. And so we just, just motored over there and we went to the same place that I stayed with uh, the first time I went, this guy Jetty over there in Varao. And so we launched from there and then we just started going out and just like started looking at all the reefs. Um, so we went out and then we just started like, went all the way to where the reefs connect to the island, went hiking for a little bit and then kind of worked our way back 
and I searched a few spots on the way back, but they were like kind of gnarly and not that good. And um, then I, you know, you kind of get stuck in there because it was so shallow. And then as we kind of rounded the, the, the bin on the way back, came across uh, uh, Chopo and it was like, uh, I just seen this wave peeling from the back. It was hard to gauge exactly what it was doing, how shallow it was or any of that. But I figured, okay, this is as good as anything else I've seen today. So let's I'll give this a dig. So I jumped in, um, got a wave and it just funneled. <laughs> it just was perfect. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so sick. And I still didn't know how shallow it was or what the deal was quite yet. I didn't understand the whole entirety of the wave or anything, but I just, just for that little, you know, speck sliver of time and, and uh, experience, it was just like these perfect funneling, like four to six foot drainers and uh, really, really perfect, really good late afternoon. One of those afternoons where it's super clear, everything was just right. You know, the, the, the uh, mountains in the background were, uh, lit up from the sun so super green jungle but it's just so beautiful with the sun on it and the light late afternoon light coming through the wave is just like unbelievable you know and so that was the, the first time that we surfed it and then you know the, the the funny parts were on the way in and i don't know if you want to get into that but uh oh yeah yeah so okay so basically uh um coming back in because it was getting late we surfed it till quite quite late in the afternoon because it's so good uh, and we didn't, you know, the markers weren't as set up and we didn't know jack squat about where the markers were or anything. So you know how clean and glassy it is on the inside of the reef? So we're like, you know, we're like, okay, we got to make it back all the way to Varao, you know, like we got a ways to go. So we're blazing it. And um, we're on the inside, just like, bang, like blazing with the Zodiac. And all of a sudden we just go, bah! we just ram right into this piece of reef. And the zodiac just goes, shh, it just starts de deflating. And I'm like, oh no, this is so bad, you know? And, uh, and I was bummed because we like, we, re we ran into this reef, you know? And I was like, oh, this is going to be hectic. So uh, I feel, I mean, I, I felt bad for the reef as well. Like we're, we're, that was, I'm sure that the reef was pretty bummed. <laughs> we smashed it. And uh, anyway, uh, you know, we had to jump out and, take the thing off of the reef and, and kind of like pull it off and stuff. And, um, but part, most of the, uh, uh, inflatable boat was still inflated. Like it was just like a, a section of it that deflated. And so, um, we were able to kind of like limp back. And, um, so we got going again and, and, um, cruising and it's super dark. And then all of a sudden, boom, we ran into another one. And we're just like, oh my gosh. And it's getting late. You know, I can hear people like laughing, laughing, uh, you know, on the beach and stuff. And it just felt just cooking it, you know, in this, in this rubber ducky. And so we keep, we keep going, um, finally make it all the way back. You know, we're going real slow and, and we're like trying to look. And, um, you know, the second time we hit it, I think it might've hit another thing and it started like even getting more flat. So it's just like, it's kind of this, like kind of a boat, but not really. And then uh, finally got it back, drugged that thing up. And then all of a sudden, man, I, we look at each other and I'm looking at the guy that I'm, uh, I think it was Chris. And I just like, oh my God, my, I was, I just wanted to tear my skin off. I was so itchy. So evidently I think we must've hit fire coral or something, but it got all over us. And it was like, it, it was crazy. It was like, man, from my chest down, my freaking legs my balls were just like everything was just so freaking itchy and it was like man I just felt like I wanted to tear my skin off and it, I mean it lasted for about 10 minutes and then it, and but I was thinking oh I gotta go to the doctor I gotta, gotta gotta deal with this you know but it subsided and then slowly went away so anyway it was pretty nuts so that was the first day and then uh went back to the other side where we were staying and I told uh Ben seriously and well Ben well we, I think we found a sick wave you know and so the next day we came back, but we paddled it from the beach. So basically drove all the way down. I think it took us a little while to figure out where it was again, but then got down. Like I, I must've looked in or something, but we paddled, paddled out again from, um, from the beach, surfed it that next day. And um, yeah, I surfed it with Ben and yeah, then I guess he took uh Hank there like a year later or something. And then it got into the magazines and then 
kind of the rest is history in terms of like uh, how big it's become. And yeah, I mean, I didn't surf it big until like, uh, like really big, uh, probably until uh, the nineties, uh, mid, mid, early, early nineties, mid nineties, went back down there. And cause I, I made a couple trips there and got it like fun, but not like big, you know how it gets like when it's over 12 feet. So when it's over 12 feet, it's like, starts mutating and starts really like it, it starts becoming like the crazy way that it can become. And, um, so that was the, that was the, uh, first, um, experience in big, big waves, uh, you know, and, and I basically, what I did is I just paddled out, uh, by myself. Cause I figured I just was going to watch it cause it was so big and, um, you know, it was washing over the roads and stuff. It was big. And, uh, and I figured, oh, I just want to see what it, it's doing out there. Like it must be incredible, you know? And so I paddled out and I just watched it again, you know, watched it and then tried to eventually tried to get a couple. I'm like, oh, I bet you could ride this thing, you know? Like I bet you it's some of these ones on the corner. I bet you could ride it. And so it was like, okay, so a wave would come. I'd paddle out. Okay, here it is. Okay, I'd start paddling for it. And then it was like, no way. Like the thing would just go under you. You know how it is? And so that's the first time in my life that I, I had the experience that when a set comes, you don't paddle out, you paddle in. And as soon as a, a set comes, you just got to start digging. And so that's, that's how that all happened anyway. in that first big, like con at least considerably big day, you know, like it was um, kind of doing it. And um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, once you make the drop, it's just like perfection. Um, it can get real tricky trying to get out of it at the end, but, um, the, the, uh, the initial drop and that whole, after the drop it like glory road. So anyway, that's, <laughs> that's some experiences at, at, uh, Teo Po'o kind of rant, ranted there a bit. But. Did you have any like horrific wipeouts with nobody around? Um, no, but I was kind of scared of the paddle. Like I didn't know what the shark situation was so much down there and I wasn't as confident uh, in the water as I, you know, as you get a little bit older, you realize, uh, that it's, it's, uh, I don't know, it's not as bad as you kind of imagine it when you're younger. And so I didn't like paddling the channel, you know? So I, um, that day I might have done it, but, uh, I was kind of scared doing it and I didn't realize, you know, yeah, how bad are the sharks in Tahiti? Like I know in Hawaii, this would be kind of a, could be a kind of gnarly thing, you know? So, uh, I didn't, um, um, so, so I guess I just paddled, paddled from, um, uh, the beach and then just kind of worked my way out. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry. What was it that you were? Uh, no, you know, what's been really intriguing is seeing your, your notebook and, uh, how calculated you are about the way waves move the different parts of the curve of a barrel. Did you start making that after a Chopu experience? Or were you already doing that prior? Yeah, that was way prior. And yeah, that, that you're asking about a wipe out there. And uh, I didn't, I didn't really, uh, I didn't really have any horrific wipeouts. The most horrific wipeout I ever had there was last year. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, but we'll get into that at a different time. But it was, that was like, that was, that sucked. It's only the second time I've ever had stitches in, in the surf. And, oh, uh, I, I, well, I did. Yeah, I was over there. Uh, it was classic. I was surfing. I was in Nazare and um, uh, I was meant to go back to Hawaii. And this guy's trying to put together this body surfing uh, movie. And so um, he's like, hey, there's a big swell coming into Tahiti. You want to you want to go down there? Because I've been thinking, oh, you could body surf that way at Garen's, you know. And um, like, I think big, you could do it if you just because some of them, you know, they just that spit just blows out, right? It's just not even like smith, it's just like white water exploding out, like barfing. So I figured if you can just like get in it and just like just torpedo it and just you could probably like get pushed out with the white water. Um, so that was my theory anyway. And uh so I was down there surfing it and I got some really good ways, like and I was learning um learning the, the whole process, like learning more how to do uh different parts of my body to get different angles and speed. So I was, I was able to make some really good barrels. And um, I figured, but I kept getting sucked over. Like no matter what I did, I kept getting sucked over. So I'd, I'd like, I'd catch the wave, get barreled, come out onto the shoulder 
and then try to get out and I just get sucked over every time. And I wasn't, you know, I'd graze the bottom, but I wasn't slamming it. And mainly, mainly cause I was, I was outside. And so my last wave, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to try this. I'm trying to, cause I know like for in surfing, if you go faster and you cut out, you get more penetration, right? And you can sometimes make it. And so, you know, I'm out there. So I, I figured, okay, I'm going to body surf this wave. I'm going to go as fast as I can, get some speed and then cut out. And, uh, Right when I started to do that, I tucked and I started going, okay, I'm going fast. I couldn't go, as, I, I go, this is, I guess, as fast as I'm going to go. I couldn't go like super fast, but I went as fast as I could. And then I went kind of low and then I cut out and I'm like, okay, <clears throat> I see how this goes. And I cut out and then I just slowly started to feel myself going over backwards on the inside now, like way on the inside. I'm just going, oh no, this isn't good, man. And so I just went, oh no, like, you know, that terrible feeling you have, like, oh, I'm going to slam. And right before I could get a full thought process done, I just slammed my back. And, you know, because I was over headed head first backwards. Because um, I went like this, right? And then I kind of went like back over like that. And so I fully skipped on the bottom. I slammed uh, my shoulder and hit my back, lower back really bad. And I uh, got stitches in my, my lower back. And uh, I got like a freaking strip of skin pulled out of my shoulder just got lickings like terrible lickings but i was thinking you know like this is not good because i don't have any flotation i don't have a leash on any board man they're not gonna find me if i get knocked out like that's it i'm done like you know and i, I didn't really think of that consequence in its entirety until i'm getting donuts you know dirty so um yeah anyways that was by far the worst like i got so lit up it was, it was terrible. <laughs> it was, terrible. you know, I, you know, surf life, uh, my whole life. And, uh, you know, living in Kona, surfing the shallow reefs over there in town. Like I'm used to surfing shallow waves, like, you know, and I, you know, I, I get raked back in the day, but you learn from that, you know, how not, how to fall and how to eat it and stuff. So it was rare for me to get reef. You know, I've, I've had entire trips to Tahiti where I don't even hit the reef because I'm just so calculated when it comes to that so anyway that was the worst wipeout incident that i've had there um and that was one of the worst wipeouts i've had period you know it's just so bad you know i was like out and then it's like you know i was totally out like the next day i'm like got bandages all over me and just like i got i got shredded from head to toe and uh yeah it sucked <laughs> but the fact, sucked. That you, the fact that you even think about body surfing that wave it just blows my mind. Well, yeah, I know. It's just, I uh, just, I, I'm just curious, man. I just think it's, it could be done and it's basically doable. Like it is totally doable. You just can't ride too far inside and you need to surf it on a good direction. Like direction is pretty important. I went back down. Um, uh, like I just posted something on my Instagram a couple of days, like maybe last week or something from another session I had. Cause I went back down to try to get it again and uh it was too west and i told the guy hey i think it's too west you know you still want to pull the trigger I'm, i might ride my board more and so i rode my board and uh then i tried to body surf a couple and both times i just got sent to the lagoon and then i'm like and raymana fortunately raymana was there because I, I tried to get out the second he pulled me the first time and the second time i was pushing my luck second time he's like you know what? just be selective more selective and i waited there and i'm saying, saying same thing you know i was like I don't want to like have to rely on Raymana to pick me up. I mean, that's super grateful he did and he was there and stuff, but it's like, that's not cool. So I didn't even catch a wave again. I just sat there and, and it turned even more West and it just got even worse. I'm like, yeah, no, nah, I'm over it. Cause it's like, man, you're on your own. Like once you, if you're in the underwater and you get hit, who's going to find you? You know, if you get, if you get KO down there, you're done. That's it. So to me, it's like super dangerous. That area I'll just have your shorts and your fins. That's it. Yeah, you're you're nuts because that area has a very special way of of recycling and not pushing you down the reef, but actually keeping you in the closeout. And the first wave sucks, but there can be three or four after, and it only gets worse. And we can Arlie, hey. we can thank Raymana for getting us out of there because I've thought about it. I got to live in the era of Raymana and then some flotation. You know, a little bit more thought out safety. Um, but I get it, and and it's it's fun. It's great to hear everybody's you know gnarly moments, and uh, 
what, what I was uh, bringing up and what comes to mind is you do some psychotic things. And now that I'm talking to you, like you're super passionate about it. Like you put yourself in these places on purpose. And when I saw the journal of, of all of the kind of the science you've come up with behind the curves and barrels of waves, I would imagine you're very calculated actually within what sounds completely nuts. Yeah, that's, that's pretty accurate. I think, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think it's kind of relative if you're like, say you're driving on the freeway, right. And you're, you're constantly going 50 miles an hour and then you slow down to 20 miles an hour. That seems slow. Right. But if you're on a skateboard, 20 miles an hour seems pretty fast. So, or, you know what I mean? So, if you're, if you're only driving at 50 miles an hour, then if you go up to 80 miles an hour or 100 miles an hour, it seems fast, right? And so if you're driving at that 80 or 100 all the time, then 50 seems slow. So it's all relative, you know? If, and so what ends up happening is you experience it as well, right? You keep pushing yourself a little bit deeper, trying to figure out like more things. There's, there's so many incredible... Uh, experiences to be had in the ocean and what's deemed rideable and, and riding it and challenging yourself against it and just seeing the possibilities, you know, and the fact that the safety has improved as well, like uh, flotation and padding. Now um, there's some cool things that, that have come up that have made, made it a lot safer. So Speaking of what's, what's possible, when I think of the boundaries that you've broken, which is many, um, what was it like towing Jaws? Uh, yeah, so it was, um, it was incredible. It was, like, amazing, you know. Uh, understand, I mean, prior to that session, I had been surfing on the North Shore for 10, 15 years with Brock on the Outer East. And we've been, you know, so I've been surfing big waves for a long time. And uh, the day before that session, the first day that I surfed it uh, with the ski, we had been towing in at like, like big 18 foot, maybe 20 foot hammerheads. Wow. So yes, yeah, so, and it, it was massive. And so we were, we were super tuned. And, um, and so it's kind of a long, long story with the Jaws session, but um, basically I missed another flight. I was supposed to go up to the mainland and uh i was at the time i was sponsored by uh, mattel and they had this like super high-end photographer that they flew in from europe this one ad agency i guess had convinced them that they need this particular look so it was, it was this like super famous photographer dude and so i was i was supposed to be fly up for this um um you know photo shoot right and so i looked at my ticket it said 10 50. i figured that's what that was the boarding time it was actually the departure time so, uh, and so, and at the time I was flying first class as my sponsorship, I was like, just dialed. That was part of my deal. And so, um, uh, I would show up at the gate and I go into the newsstand to look, look up, uh, there's a contest, some sort of contest on the North Shore. I was just trying to find that. I find that I go to the gate and then they're like, Oh, um, yeah, no, sorry. You can't get on the flights closed. I'm like, what do you mean? The flights closed. The plane's right there. And I, I'm just open up the door. Let me in. And that, as soon as I said that, the plane just pulls back. I'm like, oh, it's just, no. So then they're like, okay. I go, okay, I got to get on that flight, man. I'm going to get screwed by my sponsor. You know, they're going to kill me, man. They just spent all this money to line up this photo shoot. And um, so I, 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 I say, okay, when's the next flight? I need the next flight. When, it, when is it? And so they're all, oh, yeah, it's, it's tomorrow. It's at, uh, it's at six. And I'm like, okay, book me on that one. So I leave. I leave, I go, I go home, I get home about midnight, you know, by the time it's all said and done. I got to wake up six, so I got to get up at four. So I get like about four hours of sleep, get to the airport, okay, lock my keys in the car, go to the gate, oh, 6 p.m. the flight leaves, not 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, fine, I go to the, the parking attendant, I get a, I get a, a hanger, boom, not, break into my car. Uh, and then drive out to the North shore. The waves are being, okay, I'm surfing then screw it. You know, I'm surfing this morning. So I drive out there and I pass Himmies and it's like massive. It's as big as I've seen it. And, um, then I'm passing the bay, I get up to the bay and I forget, I ran into maybe the producer. They're all, Hey, uh, get Brock 
from the Bay or we're going to go to Maui and surf Jaws for, for that, that movie. And I'm like, shoot. Right on? In God's hands. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was like going to be like a test run kind of thing. I think it was. And, um, Derek Hoffman was on the plane. He was, he was on the plane that I was supposed to be on. I was supposed to meet him on the plane he, and he was filming. We we're working on a, a, a film project. And so he left without me to the mainland. And so he called up Sonny Miller to come to shoot me at Jaws. And so um, when I showed up, that, that's another tidbit of the story. But when I showed up, nobody really wanted to take me out, you know, because it's like, oh, this guy's going to get killed on that thing, you know? So all Laird guys, they wouldn't, they, they're like, oh man, they, you know, I think uh, it was Laird, was Derek Dorner, and those guys were just like, no, no, this guy's oh, not. Man. Yeah, like it was, and I understand it. I understand it now. Like I would have been very reluctant to grab me too. Like it's a death sentence. But Rush Randall's like, ah, whatever, just go for it. So Rush picks me up when we go, we get out there. And um, then I hook up with another driver and he tows me in on a couple waves. And it's just like, as soon as I got there, I knew that it was like, uh, hold on, man. it was like, uh, uh, I knew that this wave was, super significant like i knew that this way it was like almost like the level when you see you know the first time you saw a pipe it was just like so much different you know it's not another league when you see joe paul is like this way is another level and uh uh and jaws was the same thing it was like this you know it's like a it's like a the big waves i've been surfing on the north shore but this is like a sm small wave that's like bully and hollow so it's like a it's like a 20 foot GLAN or something or not or 20 foot uh, VLAN, you know, like a, just a super hollow bully wave. And, and it was like, wow, this is incredible. And so the guy that told me in, um, uh, yeah, he just kind of like went outside on a set and I just like held on basically, you know, and, uh, it was pretty, uh, nerve wracking because I started to hit some, uh, wakes in the, um, in the, uh, uh, from the skis and stuff, I think. And I started, started to bounce almost out of control. I'm just like, oh, no, this isn't good. This isn't good. And so I got to the bottom. And here's this whole freaking section, like 20-foot section just lining up. And I'm like, oh, man, I got to just freaking pull into this thing, you know. And I just think it was instinct at that point because it's like, it's so gnarly. Like, okay, you just got to pull. You just got to freaking pull into this thing, you know. And the way it's set up is just like automatic. Like, it's just, you know, okay, this thing's bowling. Like, I'm here. If I try to go here, it's going to go like that. And I'm just going to get like disintegrated. So, okay, try to get a bottom turn in and pull into this thing. And so that's, that's what ended up happening, man. I pulled in and, and, I, and fortunately it stayed open enough and it didn't clamshell that bad. And so I was able to kind of pop out at the end and it was just like, whoo, but it was a, uh, it was pretty nerve wracking. Like on the way down, I'm like, oh my gosh, it was just basically a controlled crash. Like I just thought I was going to die. And, uh, you know, this is before inflation, before all that. So if you got pushed down, that's it, man. You'd get, you'd be down there for, for durations. So did your confidence level skyrocket, like going back to pipeline after a ride like that? Uh, my, my perspective, um, definitely broadened. And so, I mean, you know, wave like pipeline when it's, you know, I, I I'll be, uh, scared of a three foot wave. You know, like there, if, if the, there's some spots I've surfed that are just so gnarly and nuggety that it's like three foot is like, that's hectic. You're going to get smashed. So uh, I always respect, you know, uh, hollow waves and, and uh, waves like pipeline. So my, my pr perspective has changed perhaps for sure. Probably I, I would probably say, but in, in terms of like, oh, I'm not afraid of pipe anymore or not afraid of that. No, no, you always got to be, you know, Cause if you don't like the moment you don't is when you start really getting punished, you know, like take, you know, take your eye off the eye off the prize or off the ball. Hearing you bring up a brand like Mattel, it makes me think about, you know, Mike Stewart that was on Oahu just starting to surf pipeline. There was no such thing as a bodyboard tour, or I would say a bodyboard industry throughout the years. You've won nine world titles. What, yeah. What was it like in the beginning and, and that first world title and then growing with a brand new industry? Yeah, it was super cool. Um, 
you know, super humble beginnings, like in Kona and stuff, it was mainly just fantasy about professional surfing. I mean, this was back early days. I mean, pro surfing didn't really exist. There was a couple of events on the North Shore, like Triple Crown was just like, uh, it was either just starting or it hadn't started yet. There's just a few events over there. And um, so there wasn't, it wasn't really a, a realistic uh, a career path. And, and so it was mainly just go and do it. And it was more of a, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to live, uh, you know, as humbly as I have to, but I want to experience this. And so it was more about chasing the experience and, and, and that whole thrill and uh, the fantasy of becoming, you know, a world champion uh, as, cause I missed, there was one event that happened at pipe in the 80 and I missed that. I just saw it in the magazines after it happened. Uh, had I known about it, I probably would have flown over to Oahu and tried to compete in it, but I didn't know about it. So, um, you know, this is back when you got your information in the magazines, which was months after the fact. So, um, yeah. So anyway, um, it was, uh, um, it was, uh, when I, then, it, then they said, Hey, we're going to do the world championship. It's going to be a pipe and, but you got to qualify. You got to go to these different events and qualify. So I like, Oh man, what do I got to do? I got to go to the mainland and try qualify for this thing. So I did that. I went over and got a, did a couple of events and then um, uh, to qualify. But then the first year I didn't, I didn't make it. I got third the first year, um, but it was good. It was a, it was a, it was a good, um, real good learning curve. And it was also like, I learned a lot about um, what I could and couldn't do out there. Mm. And so my idea was, okay, cause I've been doing these rolls and stuff and just hitting the lip in, in Kona. I'm like, Oh, I want to do that at pipe, you know? And I couldn't figure it out. Like, how am I going to do this at pipe? Like, you know, and I just couldn't figure out how to do it. And then finally it clicked in like, like a semifinal. I'm like, Oh, it's just a matter of timing. You just got to slow down a little bit. And then I just slowed down and just hit it and boom, it all, it all just kind of happened. And, uh, after that, I was just like, I could do them pretty much. I knew what I could do them. And so it kind of put me in a competitive level. And uh, so I was able to compete. And so the next year, um, I, I came back and I won it. And that was my first title. And uh, that was like, it was really cool because, you know, when you try to strive for something for so long, it's such an amazing feeling when you, when you reach your destination. And at that point, I had been like pretty... Um, like I was in college, I was like, I think I was in college and, uh, like I, I had already kind of developed some, uh, method to doing things like through school and stuff and, and, and just different, different things. And so, um, uh, that was, uh, the, yeah. So what ends up happening, right. You start running up to this hill of, the, of this contest and then I got there and what I didn't expect was, uh, like a week or so afterwards, I felt kind of depressed. Hmm. And it was like, I, you know, I, I reached my goal and I didn't recalibrate and I just kind of like, so I was like, and I just kind of did this free fill. I was like, Oh, now what? Like, okay, I did that. It was awesome. And it was an amazing experience, but it didn't now what? Like, Oh, now what? Let's go for 10. You know? <laughs> so recalibrate, had to recalibrate, you know, reconsider everything and try to figure out, okay, what, where do we go from here? And, um, but I did not anticipate that, uh, that, kind of down sure. where you feel a little bit down right after you you win it because you've been working for a goal for so long once you obtain that goal where do you go past that you know so you gotta always uh recalibrate uh when you're doing that what does that mean to you what does recalibrate mean what sort of stretch yeah, re just, yeah repositioning your your targets repositioning your where you want to go and uh so that was that was kind of a um a really important lesson to learn, you know. Were and, you training? Were you dieting? Like, did when once you no, went? To okay, yeah. So that, that's a thing. Like, I, you know, back then, uh, there wasn't a lot of knowledge on on that, or if there was, I didn't have access. I did not access it. I didn't realize the importance of that. Later on, as I started competing and taking it more um, serious, and uh, then I started like, okay. You know, you got to figure like the, the complete athlete is like this. And then what percentages are of, you know, different things. You got your, your, your technique, you got your physical, you got your mental, and you just got to weigh in as many things as you can. And so that's when I started like paying attention to it and really starting to um, trying to learn it more and figure it out. And, uh, um, you know, 
and at least doing what you think is right. And, and I came to find out that a lot of things I was doing um, early on that I thought was uh, really productive was totally counterproductive. Like I used to carb load and stuff, you know, so I'd carb load before, uh, because, you know, that was, you know, marathons are carb loading. So yeah, okay, I'm going to surf next day. I'm going to be like, have all this glycogen on, on in me, you know, but it was just like crazy uh, carb loading and it just bogged me down. And I, like, I look back on it now, I'm like, I think I could have won more contests if I was like, if I had a better diet only because, you know, I used to grind like big bowls of pasta and stuff the night before, even in the morning, I have big pancakes and stuff like, you know, so totally the opposite diet of what, what I probably should have had and, and learned later that uh, was, you know, what was good diet and what wasn't. So it is so cool. I recently saw you at ship Stearns. You are fit as ever. Some of the greatest talks I had for you on the steps when I was living at the Volcom house. But what I noticed was your diet. Like when we were coming eating sandwiches, you had your bag of nuts, you had, you had your, your food yeah. laid out. And I, I'm like, God, okay, Mike is purposefully doing this. Like you are, you are making your life so that you can still. Yeah. I want to be able to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, as you hit different uh, uh, stages in your life, you know, like to me, 40 was a pretty big one because uh, not only, not only uh, is your life, does a life, you know, there's life circumstances that start happening, you know, family and, and whatnot. Um, your body goes through another change. Right. So for me, it was real definitive at 40. Like I felt pretty um, uh, not, not as uh, I couldn't recover as fast. I mean, I was noticing these things. I was, I would tire quicker, you know, all these things. And, um, and I, you know, I was doing my business and so I was like powering on that. And it was like, I wasn't living the most health, healthy lifestyle. And then, my wife's all, okay, well, you got to make a choice, man. You, you know, if you're going to keep surfing high, if you want to keep going at a high level, you got to really like start applying yourself in a different way. Because I was like staying up super late and working, you know, late at night, you know, like one, I'd be up just trying to get stuff figured out and work to, you know, create the company. And um, so it was really counterproductive to being, being healthy. And um, by chance, I went over to Maui and I, I had competed in a contest and I actually ended up winning and I didn't think I was going to get out of my first heat. I just felt like I was that out of touch and I just kind of kept going through it, heat and heat. And even towards the, even at the final, I was like, in the final, like, uh, I see all these guys gathering on the, on the side of the thing. And then they're like, yeah, they're like yelling. And I'm like looking over my shoulder. Oh, what's his name? Must have won it. Or, you know, oh, this guy probably won. And I'm like, wait, there's no one around. And then I look and then I look and I went, they're looking at me. I'm like, well, no way. Did I win it? And so I was like, just so amped. And I'm like, gosh, you know, I'm 40. I just won that. Can I, if I really applied myself, what could I do? How far could I go? You know? And so I've kind of been on that, embarked on that journey. And what I did is I, I lined up with uh, uh, Paul Check. Hmm. Uh, I think, you know, I think we saw some things like Laird and Gabby were doing some stuff with him. And, and my wife wrote him a letter a nice letter and then said, Hey, you know, cause he didn't really take on new clients. He doesn't, he doesn't take on new clients, but I guess the letter was pretty convincing. And so, um, so I went to go see him and it was pretty transformative in a lot of ways, you know, not just, uh, not just diet and, and health, but, um, uh, just a realization of things as well. That's a whole nother, <laughs> whole nother thing, but, um, super cool. But yeah, uh, the, the key takeaway from that was like, I got, I realized my diet was, super whack the things i thought were healthy were not healthy um and you know my my wife is a dietitian and even she was unaware of a lot of the things like just the way that they they they, they teach uh in school and stuff i mean now it's a lot better you know in the last i'd say in the last 10 years 15 years it's gotten a lot better but prior to that it was still like they didn't really understand the chemistry and everything that you know the um microbiome in your gut and all these things you know play such a significant role and so uh uh yeah the, the main thing i guess is just really monitoring how you feel after you eat something and this kind of this kind of holds true with uh other things too not just not just uh i mean it's a good thing to learn from the diet but it actually holds true for um fitness and everything like you got to just be real sensitive to your body and listen to your body and try to tune into uh, what, what's working for you and what's not and pay attention to what you eat and, you know, pay real, there's, 
if you start getting into the diet of, of, of uh, uh, you, you know, human diet, it's like Pandora's box. It opens up so many wormholes and there's, it's just, it's, it's incredible how complex the whole systems are and how important various things are that you don't think are very, very important, but they make sense afterwards. So uh, I guess for me, like I try, I, I won't drink, I'll, I'll try to stay away from tap water because there's a lot of chemicals in that, like antimicrobial chemicals mm -hmm. and anti, um, and so that's good for bad bacteria, but it's also uh, bad for good bacteria when you drink it. So uh, I stay away from that and try to, you know, I, I'll drink like reverse osmosis or, or mineral water. And then um, that's pretty key. And then I just, I have like, I follow like a metabolic typing diet, which is basically, you know, they take your metabolic type and then you, you go through these tests and so forth. So it's pretty involved. But really what it comes down to is just eating smart and feeling really paying attention to how you feel after your diet. And you should not only feel energized, but you should feel like uplifted, like stoked and spiritually high, you know, for the most part. So that's really important. You know, you want to be feeling that as much as possible. I and love that, it. Thanks for sharing yeah. about that. Um, you know, we could talk, we could talk for hours about that alone. Yeah, you know? And I don't want to keep it too long. Something that I'm, you know, really curious about is, you've been doing this for decades and you're still as passionate as ever. How has your perspective changed when you paddle out now on a perfect day compared to when you were sitting there winning, you know, being a world champion? Yeah. It's uh, yeah. I, would, I mean, it's the same. Yeah. It, I mean, I'm still super amped to go. Like, I don't know why I just, I just am. I'm just super, uh, I think I've just been able to stay curious and stay um, intrigued and uh, appreciate it a lot. Um, when you can't surf, you know, you really understand, uh, how, how important it is and how, um, impactful it can be. And so I just savor it every time. And, you know, uh, I, I don't, I'm definitely not as, uh, disciplined as I use. I'm still, I still get out there and I still, still like to be able to, uh, you know, um, interact and, and learn and engage because it's continuous. It's like a, you know, it's like a continual, um, uh, you can spend your whole life as I've been doing and still not know it, you know, like you can, it's like you just, you're, you're, you can learn. But the nice thing about it is it is, it is similar to a lot of things in life where you can be used as like a, a stepping stone, right? Where you can get a certain amount of scale set and it gives you access to these kinds of experiences and these kinds of waves. you surf that for a while and then you can go to, you know what I mean? So it's just, just learning uh, and building off of your strengths. I love it. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, to, to ask you one more question, I'm going to pull from the audience. And yeah. something I really like to ask of all my heroes, which you are, you know, it relates to a, a kid with a dream. And when somebody asked, uh, Chris Hasso asked, what would you say to 13-year-old Mike Stewart? Oh, gosh. Let me see. That's a good question. Um. I don't know if I'd say much because uh, things worked out, you know, like they, they work out pretty well, regardless. Like if you don't have the discipline, you're not going to get far. And so, uh, you know, there's lots of um, uh, things in life that happen and uh, you learn from those things. And naturally you'll learn like if you, if you want to uh, get somewhere or if you want to do something, you know, here, I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'll try to see if I can, this uh, IGTV is uh... Yeah, I think the Instagram ends at 59 minutes. <laughs> All right, well, that's, that's uh, anyway, that's going there. So, um, yeah, so uh, what I would tell to a 13-year-old me is, um, yeah, I think, I mean, everything worked out good for me in, in so many ways, and I, I cringe on trying to interfere to some degree like i would i would be interested to see how it might impact me um i didn't really have that sort of of guidance um but uh i guess what you could say to someone uh might be um to just kind of put your energy towards things that are gonna take you to where you want to go and what you want to do like don't put energy into things that are going to uh take you away from what you want 
and that includes people, um, uh, situations, uh, so many things, you know, it applies so many, in so many different ways, but you know, you can think that something might take you to a better place, but actually you put energy into that. It might take you into a, not a good place. So you want to really try to figure out the things that are, and, and if you don't know the answers, then seek advice from elders or, or Kapuna or people that would know and, uh, you know, get advice from people. So keep an open mind, listen to people, put your energy into positive places, I guess. Um, Perfect. I love it. Mike, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Story time has been fantastic. You're an open book. We could do years of this and uh, it, it's been enough of your time. I so appreciate getting an insight into, you know, so many people can, everybody considers you the best ever. So, uh, thanks, man. No, I, don't, yeah, so, I don't know. About that. Get to do this is so rad. Yeah, I really cool. appreciate super it. Cool, Alex. Yeah, super cool. cool. Uh, seeing you again, too. It's been a while since uh, we hung out. I hope to see you at a perfect barrel the next time we see each other. Yeah, likewise. If, we, if it is, it means that, that uh, we're getting we're having a good session. So, you are, awesome. like, Mike, you're still so inspiring. I really got uh, it. Cool. I appreciate that, Alex. You're a very good mentor for surfers, bodyboarders, anybody alike. The passion that you carry, the yes, right. uh, curiosity, as you call it, it's really infectious. And I want to be doing what you're doing at your age. So uh, it's great to hear advice and, and how you've done it. Yeah, well, anytime you need help with anything, I'll do my best to uh, help you or anyone else listening. It's fine. Just drop me an email or message me on Instagram. It's fine. Awesome. You're the best, Mike. Thank you so much. Thanks. (laughs) Right on, Alex. You. Later. Thanks, man.